Welcome to the second episode of Continuum Meditations Discusses. Sadly, while in the editing stages of this, the ongoing piece in my review of Rogue One, a Star Wars story, I learned that actress Carrie Fisher, most renowned and beloved to the world and Star Wars fans as Princess Leia Organa, died yesterday, early Tuesday morning, December 27, 2016. She will be sorrowfully missed by the Star Wars community and all who knew and loved her dearly. I am also sad to amend this recording with news I just learned that, as of earlier tonight, Wednesday, December 28, 2016, Carrie Fisher's mother, Debbie Reynolds, a longtime respected actress from Hollywood's golden era, joined her daughter in death just one day after Carrie Fisher's own passing. Continuum Meditations sends its condolences to the family of these two extraordinary women and wishes them blessings and peace as they heal from their loss. May the memories of their loved ones go on unforgotten, forever shining bright. What follows next are my continuing reflections on Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Okay, so let's talk about Jin Erso a little bit, who I also believe was a very intriguing character uh, and a very well-acted character by Felicity Jones in the movie. I think she had overall a good backstory. Uh, I like the fact that they showed her from childhood as a little girl, and they showed her family uh, from her perspective as a little girl uh, with uh, Galen and her mother. I don't remember the name of the mom, but anyway, with with her parents there on, on the planet that they were on, showing them hiding away from the Empire as farmers in an attempt by Galen Erso not to be found by director Orson Krennic and to have his knowledge as a scientist used to continue building the Death Star. So from this standpoint, seeing Jen Erso as a little girl was very good. Seeing her rescued by Saul Guerrero was very interesting, and I'll get to Saul Guerrero in a little bit. Seeing that tie-in from the Clone Wars with Forrest Whitaker uh, was, was a very intriguing point. I would like to, on that point though, I would like to have seen some more backstory between her time Time that she spent with Saul Guerrero, first learning the ropes of how to fight as an insurgent, be explored a little more. We basically skip from the time that he rescues her once Orson Krennic comes to take take them away. We basically skip from the time that, that Saul Guerrero rescues Jen Urso as a little girl to effectively the time that she is an adult uh, being sent to some imperial stockade somewhere on some world, okay? All of that backstory that's in between that. What happened to those intervening, I don't know, 10, 15 years or whatever? What happened to those intervening years where she was learning how to fight under Saul Guerrero's leadership to the time where she basically becomes a criminal being out there on her own, basically just doing whatever she can and has to in order to survive. I would have wanted to have seen some more backstory on that, and that to me, in my opinion, would have endeared this character to me even more. I did in fact like the character, don't misunderstand, but I wanted to see more development of her, just as I think uh, you know, s development on several of these characters was missing overall. She as the lead, in my opinion, deserved and should have had much more backstory developed in her in her storyline, and I think that that was missing. But I did enjoy the fact of how her relationship with her father was redeemed. One of the best scenes, one of the uh, emotionally speaking, was when she caught up with Saul Guerrero, with him as an old man hiding out uh, on Jeddah, and she sees this hologram of her father, and basically she just breaks down completely when she sees what has motivated her father to keep working on the Death Star project for all of these years, not even knowing if his daughter was alive, not even knowing how to contact her, but doing his best to try to make sure that neither she nor anyone else, but especially her, fell victim to Orson Krennic and the Empire's plans for this Death Star by being able to use her as a trump card against him to force him to continue working on the project. So I thought that that, that backstory was very good. Um, I wanted to see more between her and her father. The basic reunion that we get between Jen Urso and her father is when he is on this platform with Orson Krennic and 
uh, the uh, on Yavin 4, I think it is, and the Rebel Alliance begins this sneak attack against this Imperial base where Krennic and Urs Galen Urso and the other members of the, uh, the Death Star Project have assembled. And as a consequence of that attack, Galen Urso is killed before he really has any kind of meaningful reunion with his daughter. They only exchange a few words between one another before he dies. And uh, of course, that's the end of that. But if they had developed that just a little bit more, uh, I think that that would have been a little bit more of an emotional, uh, had a little bit more of an emotional impact on the audience. I know it would have for me. Uh, also, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more in, in her intervening years when she became an adult. What happened after she left Saul Guer Guerrero's tutelage? What happens when she was not up under his wing anymore? We find out in the movie that she actually was in fact abandoned when she was 16 years old by Saul Guerrero. And he gives us a very plausible uh, and, and good reason why he did that. And that reason was to make sure that she was not used. Once again, if they had caught up with Saul Guerrero and, he, and she was with him at the time, they would have caught her as well. And he did not want to see her captured by the Empire, so he decides to abandon her to ensure that they cannot use her as a, as a bargaining chip to make Galen Urso continue working on the Death Star project. Okay, so that's very interesting there. But what happened after that time? We catch up with uh, with uh, with Jen or so when she's about somewhere I'm guessing between the neck of the woods of 22 to 25 years old or something like that in the storyline. I may be wrong about that, but she looks like a very young woman in the storyline. We catch up with her when she is not she's just shy, probably somewhere of 30 30 years old. What happened between 16 and 30 years old? I mean, you're talking about a, a, a 14 or years or so gap there. What happens to make her the kind of hardened criminal survivor that she later on becomes? We don't know that, and I'm hoping that if we get an extended edition of this movie, some of these gaps will be filled in with some of these major characters, because I really believe that we deserve to see that. But overall, I like the character of Jin Urso. I thought that she was a worthy inclusion of this movie, and as the lead in this movie, I believe that her position was well placed because of her relationship to uh, the Imperial scientist, her father, Galen Urso. She was the appropriate person to send after him in this regard. And I think Felicity Jones, I have to congratulate her. She did an, an excellent job of acting this part uh, with respect to this character. Okay, so let's talk about the standout character, which I have heard a lot of praise for in Rogue One, and I have to thoroughly agree with that assessment. The <laughs> the everybody, I think, everybody's new favorite droid of all time uh, in Star Wars right now has to be K2SO as played by Alan Tudyk. I mean, this has to be the best droid of all Star Wars movies at this point, in my opinion, even eclipsing the magnificent C-3PO and R2-D2. K-2SO had some of the most uh, sardonic and salty humor and an, an attitude that you have ever seen from a droid in any Star Wars movie that has, has been filmed to this point. And I'm not just talking about the films, but I'm also talking about the TV series, the, the, the animated TV series, the Clone Wars, uh, Star Wars Rebels, uh, any uh, of all of the books that I have uh, looked at and read, magazines, whatever you want to say, K2SO has got it. He takes the cake. And this character, if you want to talk about a character that was the most endearing out of all of the characters that we watched in, in Rogue One, this droid was it. This droid, as I said, has... <laughs> <laughs> he had some of the best interaction out of all the characters with it that were in the in this in the film. He was funny, and he he really has a uh, a, a sardonic wit that you cannot escape. It is this salty attitude that he that he gives off with no effort whatsoever. By the way, it's just like his programming just went. A, the artificial intelligence within him just kicked into overdrive at some kind of quantum level, and he just assimilated the saltiest of all salty attitudes of any human beings that he's been around, and I don't even think Cassian Andor was his example. Somehow or another, this droid has just become the 
dreariest kind of droid, but in a witty way that you could ever see in the Star Wars universe. And I have to give a lot of praise to how Alan Tudyk uh, brought this character to life and how he played the character off against the other characters in the storyline. He is, in fact, the standout character. He stole the show uh, in the of the entire movie, and in my opinion, out of all of the people who died in this movie, which we know was all of them, of course, K2SO's death was the best. I felt his death the most, his sacrifice so that Jin uh, and Cassian could actually retrieve the plans in the end, combined with everything else that he had endured with them in order to get get this far in the movie and to get them that this far in the movie to retrieving the plans that sacrifice was worthy of a droid now we know of course he is a droid he might be able to come back because you know he can be reprogrammed and rebuilt and all this other kind of stuff but i wouldn't want to see that personally i thought that this droid this non-human character he, he he really had the 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 death that was the hero's death in the hero's death in the entire storyline and he stole the show i can't give enough praise to how this character was executed in this movie i loved k2so he is one of the chief reasons in my opinion to see this movie for a second time which i am in fact going to do um but he is, in fact, one of the chief reasons to see this movie again and to really enjoy it. There was humor there. There was uh, there was this sarcastic, uh, salty wit there. He had the best kind of... Uh, he was the best standout character of all in this storyline, and I really appreciated that. So let's talk about Chirut Imwe and Bayes Malbus. Uh, we first meet Chirut Imwe on Jeddah, where he is uh, perhaps... Uh, I don't know if he is actually one of the Guardians of the Wills or if he is uh, one of those who is a remnant of the Guardians of the Wills. But in any event, we meet Chirut Imwe, who is the blind warrior monk. He is a mendicant priest who basically sits around the old uh, Jedi temple that is on in the city of Jeddah as something of a guardian, if you will, of the old ways, a keeper of the flame of the now extinct Jedi Order. And Baze Malbus, played by Zhang Wen, or Jiang Wen, uh, is his uh, compatriot. These two characters, Chirut Imwe and Baze Malbus, uh, if I want to summarize them, I would say that they're in, in, their, in watching their deaths, I think they both went out like champions, both of them. Uh, but I would have liked to have seen more development. Now, again, Chirut Imwe is like the blind warrior monk. Bayes Malbus is like the cynical soldier of fortune. And in that sense, uh, their characters are kind of typical archetypes. You see uh, that kind of archetype in a lot of martial arts movies. Uh, you see it in westerns, in war stories, uh, in space operas. There's nothing atypical about that. And there's nothing particularly that stands out about that part of them itself. But how they execute this, in my opinion, is what sets them apart. The blind warrior monk Chirut Imwe uh, is, in fact, Force-sensitive to some degree. He is not as Force-sensitive as a Jedi. He cannot uh, do things like Force pushes. He uh, doesn't seem like he can do things like uh, do Force influence, where he can uh, control the mind of, of another person or other things of this nature. But he can feel things in the Force that other people don't. Uh, for example, he feels that Cassian Andor, when they finally reach this uh, platform where Galen Erso is, he senses that, that Cassian Andor is not there to do what he claims he's going to do, which is to try to rescue Galen Erso. He is, in fact, there to kill Galen Erso, and Chirut Imwe senses that and, and warns Jen Erso that Cassian Andor may not be, uh, his mission may not be what he says his mission is. Uh, he tells uh, them that the Force uh, looms darkly around those who intend to do harm to others, okay? So Chirut Imwe is capable of sensing, the, uh, feeling the Force in, in ways that are not quite on par with that of a Jedi, but it, it, they have some parallels, but they're not. he's not exactly co-equal. He can dodge blaster bolts, for example, just by moving and seeing his way through the Force. He can actually see through the Force, even though he is physically blind. And that is actually like another species in the Star Wars universe. I don't remember what their names are. I think they're called the Marmaluke 
Luca or something like that. Uh, those of you who are serious Star Wars fans will know that. I think they're called a Marmaluca or some species of that nature. All of the species is totally blind, but they can see through the Force. Well, Chirrut Imwe is this blind warrior monk who can see through the Force, and he can move just as well better, in fact, than people who actually have their physical sight. This enables him to dodge blaster bolts with no other movements other than just moving his body and seeing things before they happen. And he has an absolute and utter trust and faith in the Force, which is one of the things that I find to be very uh, powerful about this character. I think he has a mantra that goes, I am one with the Force, the Force is with me. And he repeats this several times uh, in the movie. I am one with the Force, the Force is with me. It's, an, it's a mantra that actually Baze Malbus takes up in, a, in reverse order when he says, the Force is with me, I am one with the Force. And that is at the very end when he sees his friend die, when Baze Malbus sees Chirrut Imwe die in his arms. Uh, but nonetheless, this mantra is repeated by Chirrut Imwe many times while he is absolutely affirming his 100% faith and trust that all is as the Force wills it and that there is nothing that will be done without the Force influencing it. So Chirrut Imwe to me was a very excellent character. Another Again, another character who I think should have been developed further, especially because of the power and the influence that he, he possessed. I think that this character's uh, influence on Jin Erso, as certainly on his friend Baze Malbus, was very apparent in the movie, and I really enjoyed watching how he, how Donnie played the character and how the character was made to fit in to the overall story. Uh, I think he should have been developed further to show just how strong that understanding is of hope uh, in the Force and what that really means for the overall mission of Rogue One as, a, as an ensemble. But uh, I did like the way he was executed to the point that he was executed. Baze Malbus, again, was uh, in a similar vein. Baze Malbus's motivation and intention was clear. I don't think that you really needed to have a lot of more development on him. He was there to support his friend who decided to go on this mission to help Rogue One. Uh, he didn't necessarily want to do it, but he did it anyway because my friend is going and therefore I am going to go to support him because if he believes in this mission, I believe in him and therefore I'm going to believe in this mission no matter what. So he's, this is, he had a sidekick status and that sidekick status was reaffirmed time and again in the movie. And Baze Malbus met his death fighting alongside his friend seeing the absolute and utter trust in the force that Chirrut Imwe had reaffirmed uh, the faith in the force that Baze Malbus did not really have but came to have over the course of the movie as he saw all of these things occurring and he saw his friend uh, continue to time and again, uh, point after point, event after event, continue to have absolute and utter trust in this mysterious uh, uh, energy field that we call the force and to execute its will uh, in the material world. These two characters were strong enough to be there as manly partners for one another, uh, but at the same time to fulfill these very different roles in the movie. And I really enjoyed watching how Baze Malbus, even though he saw he watched his friend die with his own eyes, he went to his own death fighting for the cause that his friend fought for without reservation and without hesitation. Those two were very excellent characters, uh, needed further development but those, in some ways, but those two were very excellent characters and I do in fact think that both of them went out like champions in this storyline.